I'm going to go ahead with the meeting beginning ritual now. Qili. Nian Shang Huo Tang. Sanjia Sen Ji Gong, Yi Ji Gong, Zai Ji Gong, San Ji Gong. Sanjia Gu Wei Du Chuan Shi Ji Gong. Kai Ban Yi Ji Gong. Qing Zuo Xia. Please be seated. Let's uh, do a few slides before we take our mid-meeting break. Uh, to remind everyone what the question was, here it is again. What was the thought process that enabled the ancient Chinese to come up with ideas that are so similar to modern concepts like quantum reacting? Were there any precursor texts to the Tao Te that will give us insights of this? The answer is yes. The precursor text to the Tao Te Ching is the Yi Jin. Uh, at the conclusion of my answer uh, to this question, I will show everyone the link Yi Jin with the Tao Te Ching, and you will find that it's remarkable, uh, easy and simple to do. When you understand it correctly, uh, Yi Jin is the true precursor of the Tao Te Ching. Uh, in fact, it, uh, it was something that was written more than 2,000 years before for the Tao Te Ching, so it is as ancient to the author of the Tao Te Ching as the Tao Te Ching is to us. So, Tao Te Ching is 2,500 uh, years uh, ago uh, from today, and Yi Ching is almost twice that old. Anyhow, if you study both Babalut, you can see the connection, you can see how ideas evolve. Now, the reason why I, I've been so incredibly hesitant to recommend a translation of, of Yi Jing is because I have not really seen a dumb problem. But if I explain it to you, I think you will find that it's very clear. Uh, and perhaps you can use that understanding uh, that you come away with today as a yardstick with which to measure the, uh, the quality of a Okay, so when we talk about the similarities, what are those? Uh, this we went through last time. I just want to draw everyone's attention to it once again. And there is one point, one point out of four that I want to, to emphasize a little bit, give you more of a, a background, which I think you will find interesting. So, what are some similarities? The, what I call interesting parallels. Number one, is the, the is about oneness and unity. So in physics, one of the key insights is that all things are interrelated. Everything is interdependent on one another, and everything is inseparable from one another. There are you know systems that uh, basically, if you take one part of it, you have to take the other part of it as well. Uh, if you look at the uh, the uncertainty principle. Uh, you will definitely see that. Uh, overall, the deeper you delve into physics, the more you perceive the oneness and the unity. Uh, number two, so uh, and because it's uh, it's about oneness, that's why I put it up there as number one. Number two, duality. So duality, logical, for point number two, uh, this is the essence of existence. There are so many complementary Peers uh, out there, there are things that are coming to that appear to be opposites, but are in fact complementary to one another. So that's number two. That's duality. Number three is about change. It's about motion, movement, the time factor. So the nature of reality is constant change. So this is all about eating. Eating is the book of changes. And then number four. Rather than to look at the world in terms of objects, look at the world in terms of myriad processes, many ongoing processes. So the last one, if you recall, uh, I advised the court to look at number four as the principle about how life is all about the journey, not the destination. Life is a process. So it's not where you end up, it's what happens when you, as you are getting there. 
So those are the four points. So what is the, the one thing that I want to emphasize today? Well, it's actually number two. You all listen. So the book that I brought to your attention last time is called The Tao of Physics. The John Caprock, uh, a very well-regarded physicist, um, still uh, you know, alive and well today, still doing great work in science. So he was the one who wrote that book, and he, he uh, noted the parallels, and he expanded on them. Uh, there are certain chapters that are very science-heavy, and even though, uh, even though the book was written 30 years ago, uh, the science aspect of it is still holding up extremely well. Now, uh, Dr. Capra is not the only scientist to notice the parallels between East and West, ancient and modern, spirituality and science. He was not the only one, nor was he the biggest name in physics to, to draw that connection between the two. So, there is another more high profile example, highly visible in the world of physics. You said physics, you cannot avoid running into this gentleman. He's like uh, Max Planck, he's like uh, Albert Einstein, he's a titan uh, in the field. And the scientist I am referring to is Niels Bohr. So, Richard Kaffer is not the only one to notice the parallels. Niels Bohr, as you can see, he, uh, passed away quite some time ago. Uh, he was uh, a young man around the, the turn of the century. Uh, he was like 20, he was in his mid-20s, 27, when the news reached him that the Titanic sank uh, in, in the, the North Atlantic. So that gives you sort of a sense for his time. So he made, he was famed for his uh, contributions numerous contributions uh, that increased understanding to the atomic structure. So, structure of the atom, uh, prior to him, was, uh, was a mystery, and uh, through his work, uh, verification of experiments, etc., it uh, was much, much better understood. And I'll explain in a moment, and he also made uh, numerous contributions to quantum mechanics. He also uh, was uh, one of the first to understand the connection between the two. So, the term quantum, I find today, has been uh, vastly misused and overused. So, you know, the quantum healing, quantum learning, quantum this, quantum that. So, uh, most people who are using the word quantum don't really know uh, where they came from. So, in back in Neil Moore's time, when they were just starting to get into understanding the quantum realm, one of the key insights was about quanta. A quanta is a discrete amount of energy that is required to uh, to to have an electron move to a different orbit. So when the electron uh, is uh, when you measure the distance from the electron to the nucleus, there is a certain. There are only certain distances that it can that it can be. It's not continuous. There are steps. There are discrete steps, and it requires a certain amount of energy for it to shift up or down in those orbits. Quanta, the discrete energy, later on, you know, it shows up in so many aspects of physics. And that's uh, how we ended up with quantum mechanics. So it all came from the term quantum. Now, let me let me uh, describe let me describe Niels Niels Bohr that he he uh, he sensed the principle of, of complementarity. The principle of complementarity says. Now, things could have properties that appear to be mutually exclusive, and yet they are all existent in the thing. It just uh, depends on the experiment that you set up to reveal one, 
one or the other. And the most famous example is fuel slits experiment. It's one way to see in the macroscopic world how it, how things work in the quantum world. So when you have light shining through a single slit as you cut with a cardboard, the, what appears on the other side shows that the light that you shine on slits is behaving like particles, like many little particles. Now, the moment you have another slit in the mix, you get a bending effect behind it. And that's a wave-like particle. Now, you can then, you can then obscure one or the other slit, and it goes right back to the other particle. It is as if, uh, somehow, the light knows whether, whether you are letting it shine through one slit or two. But that's crazy. So, another way to think about it is that if there is only one slit, so you know, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that light is only going through there, that one slit, then it behaves like a particle. The moment there are two slits, and light has the potential of going through either one or the other, it becomes a wave, and it goes through both to interfere with itself. But, how does the light know that? And, how does, it, how does the light care, you know, how do photons care if you know which slits you will go through, or if you don't? This is, a, this is at the heart of quantum mechanics, uh, and why people say that quantum mechanics, just, if you really understand it, you would, you would, you would realize it, you would understand none of it, because it is so incredibly crazy that it makes no sense at all. It, it's not intuitive either. At the same time, back in year four, he notices the, the particle wave duality of lights, like photons and PD, electrons, and uh, so many experiments uh, will show that, that he was taken by this, this duality, complementary duality, and he made it the centerpiece of his life and his philosophy. He won the Nobel Prize in 1922, he was knighted, in 1947, uh, and by the way, he's Danish, so this is not, uh, he's not, the, uh, uh, this is not the British uh, knighting, this is the Danish, and usually the knighthood for the Danish is only restricted to heads of state or uh, for royalty. Uh, so he was uh, knighted because of his phenomenal contribution to all of this. And when he then you know, had to present his coat of arms for his family because of his knighthood. He designed his own. The picture that you see uh, at the right hand side, you'll see the yin and yang there. There's also an inscription in the coat of arms that is not so easy to read, but I'll, uh, but I'll type it out for you. It's contraria sunt complementa in Latin, and it just means that opposites are complementary. So that's the model for his home, uh, for his family, uh, and that it appears in his home box. So you can tell that this scientist was completely into the doubt. Now, there's a little bit more that I'll, I'll talk about uh, in regards to him that I'll kind of drive home the point, but I'll, let the, I'll part the presentation on this slide as we take our five minute break. All right, time to pick it up again. So, uh, looking at the, uh, the graphic here, uh, I realized that it's uh, not really clear. It's not super clear what it shows. So, uh, I did search for a better version of the coat of arms to show you, and that's in the next slide. With this, you can see the design. Uh, the Danish knight. Uh, order of the elephants, so that's hence the elephants, uh, you can see at the bottom. Uh, the Yin and Yang symbol, very prominent there, and the, the family model, uh, Contraria of this. So, this is uh, what uh, Dr. Moore designed for himself, because for him, it was the most meaningful symbol that he could have used. 
uh, he uh, he found uh, that all the stuff that he that he got into with physics, the, the unity, the interrelatedness of everything, the the complementary duality, the the wave uh, particle duality, the the, the change processes, etc. He, he felt that none of these things were adequately addressed in Western traditions, but were actually the focus of Eastern traditions, such as what we're studying today. So, <clears throat> in the University of Copenhagen, uh, there is a statue of Niels Bohr. And in that statue, not sure if you can see it, prominently in the center, is once again the beginning and the end. So, he wanted this to represent him uh, and his understanding of this. So, now let's let's look at the ancient Chinese come upon these concepts that causes modern physics, uh, modern physicists, especially great minds like Niels Bohr, to you know totally identify with it and see the connection uh, with it. Well. Last time, we went through the beginning parts of that thinking process. Let me uh, give everyone a recap to get us all caught up on that. So, in this one slide, this encapsulates about, I don't know, 10 slides, uh, half a dozen to 10 slides from last time. So, take these step by step. First one, that's the character for observation, specifically being the detached observer. That's number one. It all starts with that. So today, we will talk about scientific observation. So back in those days, in ancient China, it was one to be detached as you observe the marvels of nature. Second, I talk about Wuxi. This is the, an ancient ruler. Uh, he was most likely uh, a leader uh, in, uh, in, in the ancient tribe. Uh, back in primitive days, it was the transition period between hunter-gatherers and agricultural society. So, he practiced being the detached observer. Specifically, he looked up at the sky, he looked at the, the clouds, the winds, the weather patterns, uh, the rain, etc. And he gained insights by observing and by developing intuition to perceive the patterns. And he was then able to use that understanding, that insight, and that intuitive grasp to make predictions. It became very accurate, and this became very important for the hunter-gatherers uh, who would oftentimes uh, venture away from the tribe for days at a time, maybe even weeks at a time, and therefore would benefit from some sort of weather forecast. So, so many groups of hunters came to him uh, to ask about what the weather is going to be like, you know, for days down the road, that he ended up making carvings on a tree so people can just go to that tree to look at his weather predictions in a similar way that you and I will go to weather.com uh, today, you know, actual weather or whatnot, to see what the weather is going to be in the next few days. So, Having had that degree of success, he was, number one, elevated into a leadership position in that tribe. And number two, he was turning his mind toward how to perceive that same pattern in reality itself, in existence itself, not just the weather, not just the sky, not just heaven, but also human beings. So he looked around. He... Uh, asked himself some questions and he, he you know observed uh, animals he observed uh, plants he observed uh, human beings uh, he looked at how human natures interacted with one another uh, he would draw connections between what he sees in nature with what he sees in human beings and I'll uh, later on, I'll show you guys exactly what those are. Uh, you can see it in the Papua symbol. So, one 
of your genocides had to do with mathematics. And this was at a when it would have been very difficult to explain mathematics to others. So he ended up uh, just making up a legend saying that he saw markings on the back of a turtle that crawled out of a river, the river, the war river. And those numbers have divine significance. And those numbers, as I showed you before, were simply the magic square. And that, you know, no matter which row, which column, which diagonal you take, the numbers add up to 15. So he marveled at this, and then he got to thinking, that, well, you know, this is definitely not obvious that you can, you can put numbers together and pay as to get this kind of interesting result. So, extending from that, there's got to be other unknown, unseen uh, laws in nature that we cannot, we cannot really know them right off the top of our heads, but we can figure it out by observing what we can see. Furthermore, that this kind of this kind of pattern, this kind of um, underlying order to all things, uh, must be what eventually gives us the complexities that we can observe in life. So he chose to he chose to depict the complexity of life using the Bakwa. Uh, as we as we go a little bit further. You're going to see some elementary things repeated over and over again. Zero and nothingness. And that's used quite a bit. And then one. So from nothingness to somethingness. So one is used quite a bit. And then two, the duality. And then three, the chain. And that's it. Everything else can be derived from zero, one, two, and three. So for instance, five, one. The eight trigrams, while eight, that's uh, basically two, take them to the third power. So that's two and three. Now, when you, when you really understand the thought process that you went through, you will suddenly find that this painting, this Chinese painting here, as you see, this becomes extremely meaningful. First of all, what's he doing? He's not looking at the painter, he's actually looking down at a turtle. So this embodies, well, first of all, the identity, you see, you know, the cyber leader, uh, the so-called legendary emperor, he's observing an aspect of nature in the turtle here. The turtle is what he claims to have the pattern, the magic pattern that we know as a magic square, so that's the reason why he's looking at the turtle. And deriving from that series of insights to eventually give him the Bakwa, which you can see at the lower left hand side of the screen. So in this one painting, you've got observation, you've got Bushi, you've got observation, you've got Wushu, you've got the number of the turtle, you've got Bakwa. So you didn't actually plan it that way, but what we talked about last time is all encapsulated. encapsulated in this one page. So, if you don't really know what I'm talking about when I refer to Boasu, the magic square, I'll just show you what it looks like. Another quick look at it. These are the markings that claim was on the back of the river from the river, from nature. Actually, just numbers. So, the number of dots that you see is represented. So, one, one dot is the number one, five dots is the number five, two dots is the number two, etc. So it can be translated like this to the new worlds into the numbers that we uh, that we know and work with. So this is the this is the scheme where everything adds up to fifteen, no matter which way you go, whether it's vertical, horizontal, or diagonal. Absolutely every Every three numbers in a straight line adds up to 15. So, let's move more. That's what we, uh, so we got to that last time. Here, I want to, I want to uh, highlight 
highlights a few words. So, looking at the looking at the magic square, how unexpectedly uh, fascinating it is, how elegant in its simplicity. So, in contemplating complexity or rising out of simplicity, you will go from the ultimate simplicity, which is zero or nothingness, followed by one, followed by two, and followed by three. One is oneness, two is complementary dualities, and three is change. Factor of time. So that is just a quick reminder. Now we can go a little bit further. Uh, we got to hear the last one as well. T thinking about how the yin and yang symbol, if you can visualize the yin and yang symbol, it's actually got the symbol itself as one thing, but the one thing contains two halves, that's the number two. And then there is a curve between the two halves, which is an indicator of movement or motion, interactions between two. Uh, so that's three. That's the dynamics. Now, the movements, the interaction of the complementary pairs, yin and yang, male and female energies, that is what creates all complexities in life. And we see that uh, biologically in terms of, of childbirth. So, we then use the trigrams to express the complex, complex patterns of life. So, trigrams surround the yin and yang symbol. And the trigrams literally are composed of three sticks. Each one of the sticks can be can be broken, which is yin, or non-continuous, or unbroken, which is yang. So when you have three sticks, and each one has two possibilities, you end up with eight total possibilities, two to the third power. So, let me explain, and so there's actually subtleties to the, to the Bakwa. Ba means eight, Hua means tiger. So, Bakwa literally means eight tiger. So, take the look. Surrounding the yin and yang symbol, what is at the very top are three continuous lines, three unbroken lines. So that represents heaven, and it represents yang. Yang energy, the male. So down below, the lines, that's the opposite. So that represents yin. That, rep that represents ground, or the earth. So, in the language of Yi Jin, this male aspect, the heavenly aspect, is Qian. So, remember, Pinyin is a little bit funky, so Q-I-A-N is actually C-H-I-A-N. You would pronounce it as if it was spelled C-H-I-A-N. Qian. And then, down below, Quan. So, at a temple like this one, if you listen to people talk in Chinese, you will hear them say Qian Quan. That is Yin and Yang. So, to be more specific, Qian is Yang, Quan is Yin. Now, when they talk about Yin and Yang, they will, they will, say, they will just say it in Chinese, Yin Yang. So there's no yin, it's just yin yang. Now there's more. So what about the other ones? Well, take a look at the, let's take a look at the horizontal pair. So you've got, you've got the broken, straight, broken. So you already know without looking at the other side that it should be continuous, broken, continuous, because it's supposed to be the opposite, right across. So they have, different things of symbology as well. So the on the left hand side, this represents fire. On the right hand side it represents water. So 
there's your north, south, east, and west, and then the other two pairs, you've got mountain versus swamp. Uh, notice that mountain is next to ground. And then you also have wind with uh, opposite to, to thunder. Thunder causes the ground to shake. Lightning strikes the ground. Wind is something that uh, that is uh, up in the sky. Movements of air. So even just the bakwa, even just the, uh, the symbol itself is deeply meaningful. And then, so what, um, what Fushi discovered is that with only eight trigrams, that was not quite enough to describe all the patterns that he could distinguish in life. However, if you get a 8 by 8, 8 times 8, or 8 to the power of 2, he will get to 64. And 64 hexagrams, that is, a, uh, the gua that has 6 lines, each of which can be broken, 64 hexagrams, 64 patterns, that describes life very well. In his own words, here's what Wuxi said. Wuxi said, Yuxi, Yuxi is Tai Ji, Tai Ji is Liang Yi, Ji Yin Yang, Yang Yi is Shen Shi Xiang, Ji Shao Yin, Tai Yin, Shao Yang, Tai Yang, Shi Xiang is Ba Gua, Ba Ba Liu Shi Shi Gua. Okay, so these words in Chinese basically depict 0 to 1 to 2 to 4 to 8 to 64. And this evolved into the thoughts expressed in the Tao Gene. And this is what leads to the interesting parallels with modern, with, uh, modern physics. So, you are probably curious about these words from Hushi, this legendary emperor. I will translate them for you in a moment. First, it's important to note the concepts. So, zero comes one from nothing comes something. Something from nothing. So, think about how that is a very good match for uh, ideas like virtual particles. So, at the quantum level, basically particles are hopping in and out of existence all the time. So, there is no uh, set thing at the quantum level. It's seething or change uh, at all times. It's, it doesn't have the stability that we observe in the macroscopic world. At the quantum level, you see uh, existence is not something that's guaranteed. Something's going to be here one moment, it's going to be gone the next. And then, I spoke of the way particles quality, um, a very good match for the yin and yang symbol in the double slit experiment. Uh, is something that you can look up. It's, uh, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. And yet, it's something that can be done in a very simple way. Okay, now, let me not delay any further and provide you with a testing. So let's take a look. I've divided it up into four lines. What does Wuxi say, actually? First, he says the unlimited produces the delimited. The delimited is the ultimate extent. So let me explain. This is, uh, this is the something from nothing part. So the unlimited is the infinite. It is also the realm, it's the field of infinite potentialities uh, that is a uh, that appears to be uh, a void. It's the void that Bruce Lee called the pregnant void. It seems to contain nothing and yet it contains the potential for all things. So from that unlimited infinite state is Created the delimited, the somethingness, the finite. Now, the finite is 
what our world is. Our world is about things that are not not infinite. So there is uh, absolutely nothing that we uh, possess that is infinite in nature. You know, our lives are not infinite. People's capabilities are not infinite. So the entire existence is what is meant by the ultimate extent that somethingness expanded, the finite expanded, encompasses all of existence. So in Chinese, a limited is Yi, and then Yongji is the limited, and then Tai Ji is the ultimate extent. So Yongji and Tai Ji are the two phrases most often used in an in an authentic tradition of the Tao. So Tai Ji, the ultimate extent, produces two aspects, the yin and yang. So you will see the characters here. Yin, yang. Now, yin and yang will in turn, you know, multiply by itself to produce form. That is, you can have big, small, larger, uh, larger, stronger, weaker, taller, shorter, etc. So when you cross that, when you cross reference two pairs, you get four possibilities. So the two aspects, the yin and yang, produce the four phenomena. And the, by the way, the easiest way to think of four phenomena are the, the, the seasons. So lesser yin, greater yin, those will be spring and summer, respectively. Uh, pardon me, is that a bad word? Lesser yin, greater yin will be the autumn and winter, respectively. And then lesser yang and greater yang will be spring and summer, respectively. So, autumn, winter, spring, summer. Four possibilities. Then, the four phenomena act on the eight trigrams, eight times eight, results in 64 hexagrams. So, hexagrams ultimately are the patterns that uh, can be distinguished in reality. So, sometimes people ask, uh, Derek, why is it so accurate when I do a casting in eating, you know, the answers I get back, it's almost kind of scary how accurate that is. And my answer is always, well, I don't know why it is so accurate. If I had to speculate, I would, uh, I would speculate that perhaps it is because, uh, you know, the answers when we had something, when they wanted to describe the patterns that exist in reality, so the eating is something that's Pattern after reality itself. Okay, so is there more? Yes, there is. I want to trace the evolution of the thoughts all the way to the Tao Te Ching. Remember, that's the that was the question. Here's the answer. So, looking at the translation will help you make sense of what is in Tao Te Ching chapter 42. Line one, Tao produces one, or Tao is the state of nothingness that contains the potentiality for everything. So, Tao is Yuji, not limited. It produces the illimited, that's the one, and the illimited is the ultimate, extends, that's the universe. Universe, remember, uni, human I, that's one. First, is song. The universe literally is one song. Second line, ultimate extent produces two aspects, the yin and yang. Well, in chapter 42, the next line says one produces two. By now, you can see what Lao Tzu was trying to accomplish with the Tao Te So, Lao Tzu knows the thinking from uh, about 2300 years before his time, and he decided to distill it into the simplest possible expression. So he gives, he gets, Tao produces one, one produces two, what he means, it 
that goes to expand produces two aspects, the yin and the yang. Next, the two aspects that use the four phenomena, uh, you know, uh, autumn, winter, spring, summer. Two produce three. Here, three means change, as in the change of seasons. Change of four seasons. Then trigrams ending up with 64 hexagrams. That's encapsulated in the next line. Three produce myriad things. That is, the change or the interaction of yin and yang produces everything. Living creatures, living things, the world in which we live, absolutely everything. So, let's finish the round trip. Let's finish the trip and map 42 to physics. Chapter 42, physics, Bell produces one, something from nothing, like the sensium fluctuation of the virtual particles in a related nature of all things, oneness, unity. Line two of chapter 42, one produces two in physics, Duality is the essence of existence, actual reaction, matter, and time matter, the wave particle paradox. Line 3, 2 produce 3. The nature of reality is dynamic, primarily characterized by constant fluctuation, movement, change. Line 4, 3 produce myriad things. We look at the world and observe myriad ongoing processes. All of it results from the above. There you go. You have, in the last six or seven slides, you've got a continuous uh, evolution from the ancient primitive times of, uh, of the Tao to the time of Lao Tzu, 2,500 years ago, to today with modern physics, uh, quantum mechanics, etc. That is how it took place. So that I think is uh, is an exhaustive uh, and perhaps exhausting answer to the question that was asked. And this presentation is being recorded, so it will definitely show up in the YouTube archives, and I would also devote some time in the next few months to make sure that on the website there's going to be uh, pointers that you can get at this this lecture easily. But now though, we need to be moving on to Dalvajin. War on two. So, 62, the Tao is the wonder of all things, the treasure of the kind person, the protection of the young kind person. Admirable words can win the public's respect. Admirable actions can improve hope. Those who are unkind, how can they be abandoned? Therefore, when crowning the emperor and installing the three ministers, Although there is the offering of J before four questions, none of it can compare to being seated in this Tao. Why the ancient value this Tao so much? Is it not said that those who seek will find, those who those with guilt will not be faulted? Then before it is the greatest value in the world. So, so that us is to look for patterns that will give us a hint as far as the structure of this chapter. So, I highlighted a bunch of characters. So, this chapter doesn't have as many as some of the other chapters that we have studied. That's okay. 
Let's take a look. So, between line two and three, we have two characters that are similar. Actually, we have three characters. We have that one there. The first character is the same as the second character, so three characters are uh, replicated from two to three. And that's because, literally, the second line says, good person. And the third line says, no good person. Not good person. Person who is bad. Or nasty, if you will. So, those characters are repeated. And then, four and five, we see the first character is the same. And then we see that we have two characters that are repeated. So, it makes sense when you consult the translation. It's talking about admirable words and then admirable actions. So, we'll get to the meaning of these characters when we get to that point. But now though, let's go ahead and take a look at this. You know. So, this thing is a little bit unexpected. Let me explain. First, in section one, you're going to see quite a bit about how the Tao is interacting with the kind person and the young kind person. So, everything from one to seven is about the Tao or the kind person versus the unkind. The good people versus the not so good. That's one to seven. From eight, but this is using what the ancients knew to be the most valuable thing uh, that they could imagine. The installation of the emperor. So, the crown of the emperor, uh, as, as great as that is, uh, was not something that compared to, to the Tao. So this is just a way to say that, you know, think of the absolute most valuable thing there is, the biggest, the grandest, that cannot compare to the Tao. So, those four lines, that's the focus. And then, the last four lines are the conclusion. The conclusion basically says, the Tao is the greatest value in the world. Okay, so, now, let's delve into one section at a time, and then one line at a time. And, by the way, the, um, uh, I will be very interested in your feedback on the discussion about physics and the Tao. As I mentioned uh, at the beginning of, the, of our meeting today, it's one of my favorite discussions. Uh, I tend to stay away from it because uh, I think that there are people who don't really care about the science aspect of it. Um, same reason why I tend not to talk about vegetarianism unless I was asked because uh, I think it can be a, I think people don't really want to hear it so if that is the case I don't want to talk about it. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at the, the very first section. I want to isolate the first three lines and go through them one by one. So, usually we just refer to the Tao as that one character there. And the next character, the second character, is he who, those who, that which is. So, together, a more complete translation would be what you see out here. That which we call the Tao. That which is the Tao. But for the sake of simplicity, I just translate it as the Tao. Then we have a character here that means 10,000, one. In fact, one who to 10,000 things, meaning everything, or the myriad of things. And then we have the apostrophe S, and then we have wonder. So, that which is the Tao is the wonder of all things. Now, what we call the Tao 
is the basis of everything. It is a value because that's where we all come from. That's the basis for everything. Now, aside from being the source where everything comes from, what we know from Tao is that we don't know. That is, there are subtleties about the Tao that we can fairly understand. That we can, we can glimpse from time to time. So, occasionally, we catch a glimpse of the Tao, but what we see, although it's just a little bit, it can be used, it can be applied in life, and it can be extremely effective. So that's, that's the first line. Second line, set means good or kind. It can also be skillful. Then means person. See, that's apostrophe as once again. Wow, that means treasure. So if you wanted to do a very straightforward translation, you, it would be something like good person's treasure. Or as I as I have it here, the treasure of the kind person. So, as I mentioned, that character can be good or skillful, not just kind. So those who are good or skillful in love know that they should treasure the Tao, they should hold on to it. They are only afraid to get too far from the Tao. They want to be close to the Tao as much as possible. Now, let's take a look at the opposite, the people who are not kind, not good, not so skillful. So, those who are not so skillful still benefit from everything that the Tao provides. The air or fruit, the sun or warmth, the ground to walk on, the food to consume, water to punch thirst, and so on. So, the Tao has a protective effect on the good and the bad. So, in Chinese, only the first character means no, sad means good or kind or skillful, then that's a person once again, and then we have the apostrophe S, and then we have the possessive there, and then Ba, their protector. So this can be translated as the unkind person's protector. Or the protection. Okay, I'll either way. So, here's, uh, here's what I want to point out uh, for everyone. If you take a look at the last two bullets here, the, the good people and the people who are not so good, the skillful people, people who are not so skillful, the kind people, you know, people who are not so kind. Can you see the yin and yang symbol there? Uh, and this is my way to sort of uh, get the point in your face, so you cannot ignore it. So, this chapter is not talking about the yin and yang directly, but it's actually using the Tao paradigm of complementary dualities. And why are the good people and the not so good people, why are they complementary to one another? It goes back to a previous chapter that we have studied that says that, well, you know, we can actually learn from both. From the good people, we can learn things to do, how to do, uh, what to do, how to be. We learn positive lessons. From the bad people, we learn what to avoid, what not to do, how not to be. So, we learn from both. They are complementary to one another. So in life, it's not enough just to know what to do. You also want to know what to avoid or what not. Moving on, let's uh, let's take a few more lines. Let's see what goes. Okay, so then we have admirable words and admirable actions. So let's take line four. So. This is um, this part is like an echo of what Bill talked about today. 
we talk, we spoke of words as the tools that we can use for good or for bad, for uplifting people, or for putting them down. So words matter. Positive words can be uplifting and inspiring. Now, this is uh, in, in the Tao Te Ching, in the commentaries, one point is uh, very clear about line four that you want to look at it from the Tao mindset of complementary duologies as well. So when you look at line four, you would think about two things. Remember, complementary duology, two things. One, you would think about what to say to other people that can be looking and inspiring. So that can range from uh, making a speech that's uplifting and inspiring to everyday words of encouragement, even just a cheerful greeting. So this is what you say. The other part of line four, admirable words can win the public's respect. The other part of it is what happens when you hear admirable words. What happens when you have someone who is full of wisdom, who's very quotable, who is providing a valuable lesson in life? Then you would want to pay attention to that. You would want to learn from that. In a similar way, we would look at line five using that same mindset. So line five is about admirable actions. So. Here, the emphasis is that you know, beautiful words are all very well, but admirable are greater than that, because actions speak louder than words. So, in line four and line five, the first character is name. Usually, the context of name is beautiful. So, you can say, Instead of admirable words, beautiful words. So instead of admirable actions, you can say, you can translate it as beautiful deeds. In this context, beautiful deeds are just admirable actions. Now, actions speak louder than words, and this is something that Tao sages and Tao cultivators recognize. Therefore, a real teacher in the Tao, a true saint, a, a teacher of an authentic tradition who understands that tradition, the primary method of teaching is not lecturing, but setting examples. Setting examples for other people to follow. And that's because, again, actions so, <clears throat> apply the same yin and yang complementary duality idea to this, and then you see that, well, you know, charitable deeds, good actions, people helping people, etc., you know, when we see that, it's a looking and inspiring. So that's what we observe. And at the same time, the flip side of it is what we do. We can aspire to conduct ourselves with admirable actions, with charitable deeds, with beautiful deeds, if you will. Something that can be helpful, as well as uplifting and inspiring to others. So, the sages look at all this, they learn from admirable words and admirable actions, and they discipline themselves to provide admirable words and admirable actions as much as they can. They use all the tools that they have. They use both words as well as actions. So, with that, let's. Uh, I think let's do. Let's do one more, and then. We will have to uh, go to the summer. So one more slide. Line six. Those who are unkind. So this is the recognition that not everyone is on the path. 
Well, I uh, recently I just witnessed uh, at my workplace uh, someone who uh, ended up getting let go because, uh, frankly, he just has no idea how to comport himself, how to how to act, what to say. He doesn't know the Tao, and it's very much to his loss because when you swim against the stream like that, things are going to be difficult. So. You know, this is a person who complains about absolutely everything. Uh, he definitely was not one for the animal words. So, he fits this description, the second bullet. Many people are ignorant of the Tao or not receptive to it. So, this ex coworker that I had was so egocentric that no one could really tell him anything. To say anything at all, say, yeah, 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 I know, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, that's, 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 no big deal. So, immediately, I knew that this person was not headed for a good place because he's definitely uh, acting against the death. So, when you talk about the people who are ignorant of the Tao, it may not be people who are swimming against the stream, it may only be people who are swept this way and that by the currents of life. That is, people who have not awakened to their full potential and know what to do. They haven't lived up to their full potential. Uh, so that would, that's actually very common. And I say common example because there's so many people uh, out there that I'm sure I know and you know, uh, people who have not lived up to their full potential. And the extreme examples are the people who have made a mess, absolute mess in their lives. And they may, they, they may be very unaware of their own role in their misfortune. So, looking at people like that, here is the basic idea. Dow cultivators still have compassion and patience. Now, you don't want to be codependent, you don't want to subject yourself to abuse, you don't want to invite that vortex or negative, negative energy into your life, but you can still look upon that with compassion. And this is all from observing nature as a heat task observer, noticing that the rain falls on everything and everyone without discrimination. And the sun shines on everything and everyone, again, without discrimination. And the breeze can be felt by everything and everyone, again, without discrimination. Bottom line, nature does not get and choose. So, even the people who are the least deserving, Dow cultivators have compassion for them. Okay, so, we have to jump to the end. And go to the summary. So remember, if you are interested in the spiritual path of Yiguan Dao, uh, please let me know. If you are interested in seeking the Tao, uh, I will help uh, to help you on that path and take you where you want to go. Reminder for uh, our schedule coming up next Sunday, October 30th. We'll, we'll continue with 62. As you can see, we did get into 62 quite a bit today, although I hope that the, uh, uh, the talk about the Tao of Physics is helpful as well. Then, after that, we will have one weekend without the Tao meeting because of the joint meeting here at the temple. Then after that, continue on in 62. Finally, let me go to the summary slide for today. The summary slide is all based on admirable words and admirable actions. So, the two distinct applications in life, number one, admirable words, inspire and motivate people with more positive words and actions. Positive words can help you elaborate, start small, help you greetings, expressions of gratitude, and take it from there. Number two, when people are down, you want to approach with compassion and generosity. 
And when we talk about generosity, it doesn't doesn't necessarily mean monetary or material assistance. Uh, what can be even more important uh, would be the little things in life. Being there for someone to be to be listening, you know, as they are troubled, uh, to a receptive ear, hopefully yours, and being supported as they get back on their feet. So little things perhaps, so that they can make a huge difference. Let's go ahead and do the meeting and the ritual, everybody. Okay, everybody, we are done. Participate in the Tao meeting by joining us online. For information, go to Taoism.net forward slash Tao.